Wolf, get away from those sheep. Bollocks. You're listening to the Wolf and the Shepherd podcast. Broadcasting from Fort Worth in the great state of Texas. Now, get ready for this episode of the Wolf and the Shepherd. Welcome to this episode of the Wolf and the Shepherd. Today we have Stephen from the band Left of the Slash. Stephen, glad you could join us. Thanks, guys, for having me. Hey, thank you for coming along today, buddy. Um, now, before we start, I want to ask the most obvious question, which possibly you've been asked by everybody who's ever asked you a question about the band. Where does the name come from? Um, so Left of the Slash originally came from a Seinfeld episode. Um, and I don't know if you guys are Seinfeld fans at all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So do you remember the episode when Kramer uh, is on a mission to take the the uh, test drive car far the, as far as he could go without getting gas. And he goes to, um, I think it was, I forgot the guy's name. And he goes, at one point he goes, we are making history now. No one's ever been this far left of the slash ever. And they're at the gas station and he won't like get the gas. And I'm like, and I was, I was young at that time. And I'm like, wait, that's kind of a cool like idea. And then I kind of took that and, turned it into something um, a little bit more serious and left this last is about like perseverance. And when people say they have nothing left in the tank, you actually still do. And you have to kind of keep fighting and use what life you have left. So I kind of use that as a play on words, but it kind of derived from, uh, you know, Michael Richards uh, Seinfeld line. So, well, you got to admit though, I mean, slash being a great guitarist that made his bones with Mm -hmm. guns and roses there could be some kind of attribution towards that, right? Like, is it left of this great guitarist from Guns N' Roses? Is that some kind of attack on him? Oh, yeah, yeah. And we get that all the time. Um, and, you know, at the time, I just, you know, obviously Guns N' Roses were prevalent, uh, but I wasn't really thinking about that. And I love Slash. I love Guns N' Roses, but it's it's not really as, as anything to do with them. Yeah. <laughs> Well, at least we cleared that up. I mean, it, there could be people that are thinking, you know, are you trying to turn away from Slash? You know, it, one of the great guitarists in the late 90s and all that sure. good stuff. So, Although I think if you were actually standing left of the Slash, you'd be uh, dying of lung cancer from all the secondhand smoke. Well, it depends if his hat falls off yeah, and hits you true. in the head. Yeah. Yeah, you because know, he has that big hat. Now, do yeah. you find... Sorry. Did you find like with the name of the band that nowadays you're kind of under pressure to find something which hasn't been used, doesn't sound like something else or hasn't fallen into that kind of area where it sounds kind of corny? Because, you know, when we go through different musical genres, the names of bands reflect that genre a little bit. And, you know, you try and choose an edgy name, but then it gets to a point where all the best ones are taken and you end up with something on the outskirts and you're kind of like, you know, this, I'm trying hard to fit in the scene here, but all the good names have been taken. So, I mean, you've got a great name for the band, but before you came up with that, were you struggling for a while or? Um, yeah, I mean, I was young at that. I mean, I, I probably, this was going around 2004. I was like 17, 18 years old at that time. So I wasn't too concerned about like, how it was going to be perceived. I was just concerned about having something that was original. And what I will say about Slash and about originality, if you wanted to think about it, you know, he, so he was in a band called Velvet Revolver and there was obviously a very more famous band called the Velvet Underground and Velvet, you know, I always thought I was like, you know, it's almost like having like Pink Floyd and another band named Pink. And I didn't think it was the most original name. But uh, no offense to Slash or anything, but uh, I will say that, um, you know, bands kind of borrow from each other. I feel like music in general, in a lot of ways, is kind of like has been passed. The the, the torch has been passed over the years. If you kind of track the lineage of how everybody has listened to Black Sabbath and, you know, from there, it's like it, it just kind of keeps going back and back. And, you know, if you talk to like, you know, any blues guitarist, they're always saying Steve Ray Vaughan, but for that it's Hendrix and then Buddy Guy and you know so you could kind of track it in that regard but I mean to really answer your question we 
I so left of the slash kind of derived from um, you know all the original music that I was writing starting in like 2005. Um, and at that time, I mean, the band name was, there was nothing really kind of like it out in the scene. We were based in New York city. That's where, where I'm from. And we were playing, you know, a lot of like, you know, the, the bars and clubs there and in the village, um, you know, and for us, it was just kind of about being original and doing something that other people aren't doing. And I think we're still trying to do that. Um, and I think, I mean, if you listen to our music, you, you'd see that, uh, it doesn't really sound a lot like a lot of the music that's being like released right now. And we're trying to do something a little bit different. Yeah. So going along those lines, give us a little bit of history about the band, right? So, you know, how did you go ahead and form the band? You know, we talk about your first gigs and all that stuff, you know, tell us about the formation of the band. Yeah, so um, I, I would say Left of the Slash 1.0 was formed in 2004, 2005 in, in New York. Um, and that's, again, that's where I'm from. Um, we, I had a friend, he was playing bass. We actually met our drummer off of Craigslist. We started, um, you know, playing gigs around New York City, Long Island, and uh, just started writing music. It was more of an instrumental trio at that time, really, because no one could really sing the parts. Um, and we were kind of, our, our voices changed a little bit since then. Uh, I moved out to LA about uh, four years ago now and got hooked up uh, with, with a number of different people out here in the music scene. And we kind of just started putting together, you know, uh, bass player, drummer. That was kind of the easy part. The harder part was kind of finishing and, and perfecting and writing the music, um, which a lot of that I've, I've done throughout the years. So when I got hooked up with Total Access Studios in, in, um, in Redondo, who actually tracked half of Appetite for Destruction, um, I, I would have to say, which was kind of cool recording there. And um, those guys are great for me. We recorded half the album there and they just said, hey, you know, we, we have a bass player, we have a drummer, as long as you have the music and, you know, we're, we're good. Um, so that was, you know, going from, I guess, the difference between 2000 and call it 2000, I'm sorry, 2020 to 2005. It's, it's a lot easier to put a band together if you would call it a band. Now, did you kind of fall into the genre of alt rock or was that something you set out immediately when you formed the band that you figured that was the type of audience you wanted to write for? I mean, with the lyrics you were writing down early on, kind of did that speak more about that type of movement in music or did you leave it kind of open and kind of see where, as you wrote more and more songs, really where your style led you? Yeah, I've always really been kind of more interested in that um, like early 90s genre of music from ranging from the Pumpkins, Tool, Alice in Chains, Nirvana, Soundgarden, I mean, those are kind of like, you know, my boys, I would say, like, those, that's who I've always got. But uh, I mean, my favorite band of all time also is Pink Floyd and Black Sabbath. So I kind of wanted to take like that type of music, Jimi Hendrix and all of that and kind of combine it with the 90s and then pick up kind of where bands like Queens of the Stone Age were in like the 2000s, right? Um, and, you know, all that kind of came together and, it, and you could kind of hear different tones of that throughout the record. Um, and, and that's kind of like what we, you know, we're trying to take a classic approach to a modern approach to a grunge approach, and it kind of all comes together, which, you know, we, we find it kind of nice. So when you go in the studio, are you recording old school, like analog to analog to digital, you know, are you hooking everything up with the, the amps and the mics into the amp, or are you going, you know, pure digital? now which a lot of musicians are just converting all to digital and right you know everything has that it's less of a warm sound so to speak yeah totally great question um well everything that you guys heard it's all those are all live amps live drums live bass um and vocals really with only a couple of takes they're not cut that many times that would probably explain some of the imperfections in my voice there. Um, I'm not a, uh, you know, trained singer in, in that regard. And 
you know, uh, we kind of looked at it and we're like, hey, there's a lot of bands and I cliche, I'm wearing a hat right now, but Dinosaur Jr., Neil Young. Um, and if you listen to their stuff, it's if they're not it's not perfect, even Nirvana, right? It's, it's rock and roll. And especially when they play live, it's never note for note um, perfection. And, and we kind of like that about music and especially we're a trio um, and we're about to play our first live show at, as left of the slash 2.0. And I'm really working hard on getting the, you know, the vocals as good as possible, but at the same time, I'm not going to be like, Hey, every, everything has to be note for note. And yeah, everything was kind of analog and, you know, we didn't do, you know, 15 guitar tracks or, you know, vocal uh, layers that were just kind of dilute like the overall production of it. And we tried to make it more like a trio rock and roll. And I think that's kind of how it came out and sounded. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the Steve Albini letter. Have you read the Steve Albini letter within utero? Oh, oh, I, I, I know, I, I know what you're talking about, but I can't, I can't reference it off the top. Of my head. Yeah, I, I what, yeah, did. well, it, well, Steve Albini wrote a letter to Nirvana about wanting to record in utero in his studio because he wanted it to sound raw. He wanted it to be really good and didn't want to put all this digital thing because, like you were saying. You know, Nirvana in 91, 92, they released Nevermind, and then right. Utero came over uh, just a couple of years after that. And that was kind of the introduction of the digital music revolution, where you plugged a guitar into a computer, you right. plugged the bass into a computer, you had a digital drum set, and everything was perfect. But the perfect sound sounded so bad. Right. And nobody could figure out why this perfect sound sounded so bad. And Steve Albini had the solution. And then he offered to record their record and be, and he doesn't like to be called a producer or whatever. I can't remember what he likes to be called. I think it was like an engineer or something like yeah. that. But it was kind of along those same lines that you still have to record analog to get that warm sound. It's a, the same reason why I still love listening to music on vinyl. So kind of along those same lines, that's what you're hunting for in your sound right now. Oh yeah. I mean, we were, you know, we were playing through, um, you know, Mesa triple rectifier. I mean, we were playing through the opposite of DI, let's just say direct input. Um, and you know, I, I think it kind of, it, it sounds that way. A, a lot of music these days, I mean, even the rock music these days, it kind of has, it ha has that perfect, um, you know, digital, you know, landscape of what you're talking about. And for us, it just kind of, it comes off as like flat and it just not as interesting. I don't know. Yeah. I think the best illustration I've heard describing the difference between digital and analog is that you know, when you make music analog, when it's recorded analog, it's like you're standing there naked. Everybody can see the imperfections, yeah. you know, the rolls of fat, they see you as they are. But when it's digital, you're wearing clothes, you're wearing makeup, you've got the correct light in it, still you, but you're getting kind of like a version of you, which is artificial and almost like soulless. It's like the difference between AI, it doesn't matter how good, you know, computers get at mimicking a human character it's still going to lack a soul. It's going to lack that vulnerability and that rawness, that learning from mistakes, that learning from mistakes, but still repeating the same mistakes. And, you know, I think it's hard now to really, with the overproduction, make something on digital sound just live as it used to be. Because even now, live shows, the recording equipment, and they've got it down so much and getting rid of, you know, the background noise. It's almost very clinical, some of the live recordings you hear. And it's not until you hear the audience at the end that you even realized it was a live recording. But you know those guys aren't playing at that kind of level live. It's just been so overproduced that if you were there, you wouldn't recognize that song was played at that concert, that it's so different from your actual experience being there. True. Well, that's, that was great. I mean, you just kind of nailed it because, I mean, we were talking about this the other day at rehearsal and, um, you know, I mean, a, a lot of bands, they'll just have everything pre-recorded and it'll be all going through Ableton Live and every single part of the, you know, set is kind of like 
done. And there's even a lot of bands that they're playing and they have guitar tracks behind the guitarist and you wouldn't even know it. Right. Um, I mean, so, I mean, some people would know it and some people could hear it, but a lot of times you can't. Um, but I, I just find that like, you know, coming from like playing on stage with two other people and that was kind of my thing and still is, you know, there's going to be stuff that you fuck up and that sometimes is cool because it's like, it shows that you're vulnerable and you're putting yourself out there and it's not as, you know, clinical as, as like an EDM show, which is kind of like, and I love EDM, by the way, I love that type of music. I love hip hop. I love a lot of that stuff. And I think the difference between like rock and roll these days is that once you go see those, some of these bands live that are on XM that you listen to and you know, they're singing through vocal processors and there's auto tune. And I'm just like, well, it, it just, it's just not the same. You don't like walk away, like invigorated, like you were seeing like Nirvana and winter. It's just, it's kind of chaos on stage. And it's just what people, it feeds off the energy from being on stage and, and, and being that raw act. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to recreate a little bit. Well, I think a lot of that problem is everybody expects a bigger show. They don't expect to just go to a little club and be amongst, I don't know, 150 people and listen to really good music. They want pyrotechnics. They want big screens behind them. They, they're they paying these big amounts of money for tickets. And so they want a show. I mean, not a music show. They want a show. And they don't really care so much about, you know, the music. They can fake that. I remember when, I think it was the Red Hot Chili Peppers did the uh, Super Bowl halftime show. And people made fun of them because there was Flea out there. And you could see he was playing the bass and there's no chord in the bass. Everything was pre-recorded. Now, yeah. for a musician, you can look at it and say, there's not even a chord in the bass. This is all fake, right? It's all pre-recorded. They're just putting on a literal show versus actually listening to the music and being out there and saying, hey, this is live music. This is this is what it's all about. And I've seen so many bands over the years that you can't even begin to capture the live music portion on tape or on digital or on a hard drive or whatever. And I think we're suffering from that. Well, I mean, I, I will say this is that I, I actually went to the Super Bowl in Houston and uh, that was Lady Gaga. And before that, I was like, you know, I, I knew that she was very talented and whatnot. But like when you see like a Super Bowl performance, that kind of has to be all pre-recorded. You know, there's no room for error there for for a myriad of reasons. Um but for us, like, you know, we're not at that level of playing the Super Bowl yet or, <laughs> you know, but I think it's more about, like you said, for like the bars and clubs and, and that kind of atmosphere, um, you know, it's that raw rock and roll mentality of seeing something you're like, well, that was original. That was, you know, they put everything into that and there wasn't all this technology behind them. And it's okay to use the technology but I think people overuse the technology as well. Well, yeah, and that's the exact point. I mean, it, there are plenty of bands back in the 90s, like, say, Nirvana or Soundgarden or whatever, that if they were getting popular now, they would use the technology. But part of their draw was the fact that they didn't have this technology. They didn't use that technology. And that's where they got this following because they could put that show on over and over. And yeah, I'm not faulting the red hot chili peppers by any means of having that pre-recorded because yeah, it's a super bowl and that's, that's a different thing, right? But there are so many bands now that can just get, you know, some cheap $250 laptop and record this stuff and just plug it into the PA and sit there and kind of fake their performance together. And if they have some great producer, they can all of a sudden sound better. Well, th yeah, that's a great point too. And, and that's why it's hard for us to compete with them because, you know, we're an independent artist um, and we're funding everything out of our own pockets at the end of the day, but we're also not going to go into the studio and say, Hey, for 
you know, I can make an album for two thousand dollars on a laptop. Like I have a home set up here, but I would never fucking try that. You know, I have way too much respect for the producers and engineers that I work with. And, and I am a producer myself and, you know, but, but there's a whole different art in making a rock and roll record um, that, you know, you, you kind of can't cheap out on it. It has to, and it sounds full a certain way and hits you a certain way um, versus something that you could tell is, you know, on a laptop and look, a lot of the bands that are, that are popular right now are making them in real studios and spending real money. But at the same time, you can hear how there's like, you know, 15 different vocal tracks and whatnot, what we were talking about before. And I, I just don't, to, to translate that live is, is very difficult to do. Now, I think that, you know, every generation that comes along kind of craps on the previous generation about, oh, your music sucked. And, you know, every generation craps on the generation which comes after them and says, well, this new music sucks. But, you know, I think people who appreciate live music, it doesn't matter what decade you're from, always kind of come back and have these iconic heroes, some of whom you mentioned earlier. But do you think, especially among the generations coming now, that there's almost like a de-appreciation of live music that they're so used to seeing these overproduced and like you said shows with fireworks and all this stuff going on and you know the super bowl things you know just seem to be to try and shock you know the shock values for everybody so it's trending on twitter they don't care who they offend just as long as they've been talked about and it's not really about the musical quality as such but you know do you think that it, it really is a dying art, live music. That I mean, there's always going to be a, a small pocket of people who are always going to appreciate it. And, you know, young people who come through who still appreciate it. But, you know, do you think it's getting towards the end of it where it's so easy to make music digitally that, uh, you know, it's only going to be the real purists who remain recording anything on an analog basis? Uh, no, I think that live music is about to make the biggest resurgence of in the history of music because of because of covid i think people are itching to go see any type of live music and i think that um i i feel like it's going to be bigger than ever honestly um and i feel like there's different types of music for example like you know edm where it's about production and it's about the pre-recording and i mean look there's a lot of edm djs out there that are doing everything live and they're doing stuff vinyl and and that's cool also and I, I love both. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it comes down to like what different, there's different levels of shows. Like there's your arena shows and then there's your, 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 your bar shows. Right. Um, and, and your, and your rock clubs. Right. So it's like, it, it, it depends of what type of level you're talking about. Right. But I think that people in general right now are just like dying to go see live music. And, you know, in your part of the country, it's been going on probably longer than out here, but it's, it's starting to come back out here. Um, but I mean, we'll see. We have our first show on September 15th at a bar in, in LA, uh, bar club. And uh, I mean, look, every time I see the news, I'm fucking scared. Like, I don't know if they're just going to just cancel it or they're going to make everyone wear a mask inside. I, I just, I can't follow. I could just only focus on what I'm doing. Um, but I know that people out here are really, dying to go see shows and they just started doing it out here again um and it's you know been very well received yeah i know my my boy a uh, couple of days ago just went to the green day concert and so is green day and weezer and fallout boy yeah. and the interrupters and i mean he, he's been a green day fan for years he's learning to play the guitar and i said hey you know, start learning Green Day songs because there's lots of power chords and everything in there. So, you, you know, you can, you know, hook up the guitar and play these power chords and you can sure. start playing songs. And he's like, oh my gosh, I, I can play like, you know, nine Green Day songs in a day. I'm like, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's great. And, and I love hearing him, you know, upstairs playing Green Day songs, but he got to go to the show and he got to watch that. And yeah, it was, you know, one of Green Day's first, shows that's touring around and they're excited about it uh you know lots of bands they're now reopening the tours they're saying hey we can do that but going back to what you were saying i've been to a lot of concerts that are in arenas but to me the little club 
is so much better. I remember one of my favorite bands, by the way, and we didn't talk about this beforehand, but one of my favorite bands is the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. And I've listened to them for years. And I remember calling my wife at that time. She was my girlfriend. And the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones did a quick show in Dallas. And we went to that show and there were 40 people in the Galaxy Club in Deep Ellum in Dallas. And to me, that's one of the best shows I've ever seen to see the nine members of the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones up on stage, a stage I played when I was in my crappy little band, right? But to look up on that stage and look around and there's 40 people in here and they put on one of the best performances I've ever seen. And there was nothing, you know, no filters, no fanciness, no anything. It was a raw show and they played for two and a half hours. I mean, it was so great, but there's so many people that don't get to witness some kind of a show like that because they think you have to go to, and of course in DFW, I'm going to name some places. You've got to go to American Airlines Center. You've got to go to some of these arenas to be able to see a show like that. And you say, no, you go to three links on in deep Ellum and you can see some great shows and just actually witness the music and not worry about the fireworks or anything like that. And I think that's what your music is actually trying to drag back in here that it, we're missing right now. Yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, I, I think you nailed it. I mean, you know, for us, we're more interested in playing, you know, places like South by Southwest and, and stages like that versus, um, you know, look, I mean, in the event that like in the next couple of years, as we get, you know, everything gets ramped up and we're going to start playing bigger and bigger venues. Um, it's a different story, but look, it's a different experience at the end of the day too, right? Like I've seen plenty of shows at the forum and some of them are great and some of them suck. And I've seen some of the bands at, you know, lesser scaled down venues and they've been better. But I mean, when you go to a, a you know, a, a concert of that scale, you're dealing with a whole different, you know, you know, there's so many more people involved behind the scenes to, 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 to produce an event like that, that it's, uh, it has to be calculated to a degree, you know? Now, where do you think alt music stands as a genre now? Because when it first became, I, I guess, what you want to call super popular bursting on the scene, a lot of the music in the charts at that time was electronic. You were getting the first you know, more lesser known hip hop artists coming into the charts. And so alt rock was very easy to spot. Well, I guess in terms of listen, you could hear a song, hear a riff and be like, oh, that sounds like an alt rock band. But now, obviously, with the way music has changed over the last 20 years, what do you think kind of defines an alt rock band? Because I mean, I, when, it, when we listen to your music, I thought you sounded very much like, off the top of my head, somebody like the Gaslight Anthem in terms you had very catchy riffs. Um, it sounded like, you know, you were at a live show, some of it. And, you know, it sounded like I'd expect an alt rock band to sound, but there's a lot of bands now, I guess, who are described as alt rock, like Panic at the Disco or something, who I really wouldn't consider an alt rock band. Right. I mean, I really wouldn't know what label to put on them, but. I, it, it's it's actually funny. I got a. I'll, I'll try and send this to you. But there was. Um, I saw this on on either Facebook or Instagram. But somebody was showing. It was the exact point of what is alt rock today versus twenty five years, twenty years ago, whatever. And um, well, I guess it was it was like thirty years ago, I guess. Um, but they were showing the Billboard charts in like nineteen ninety two versus like now right and the bands it's like it's not the same genre like it's like you're like well this band would never be in that alt rock genre so i don't really know you know it seems like that unless you're not like making justin bieber type music then that's i guess pop music but then alt rock um i mean there are a bunch of good bands right now that i that i really listen to like ty seagal car seat headrest i mean there are some good stuff out there um that are more alt rock ish but like it's such a 
general genre now versus a more specific one. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think also what you have to take into account is that the, I guess, people with the money now who buy music has shifted. Now it tends to be young teenage girls with iTunes gift cards they got from grandmother. Whereas before, again, when alt rock really burst on the scene, came in, I guess, out, a little bit out of the ghost of new wave. I mean, in England, the transition was punk, new wave, and then it kind of went into alt rock. Over here, I'm not sure if you had a little bit of a bigger gap between the new wave and the alt rock. But, you know, back then, I mean, you look at the end of the 90s, the majority of people were still buying physical copies of, you know, CDs and, and on vinyl, whereas now people want it electronic. But, you know, there's always been this joke about girls and music. Girls don't like music. Girls like music. Boys like, so boys will like them. And, you know, now you've suddenly got eight-year-olds with a $20 gift card buying 20 different songs of their selection on iTunes, whereas people are not so willing now to take a risk on an entire album by a band. They want to pick and choose. So, I mean, that approach is an old rock band where if you had one or two good tracks, it used to be able to sell an album. Now one or two tracks isn't going to sell you an album. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's a different world in a lot of ways, music wise. I mean, like, I mean, it, it, the only way to really compare it is, and this is when I was getting started in like 2005. I mean, this was before iTunes and after Napster and basically after CD. So the music industry was more fucked up then than ever. Now it's arguably pretty fucked up after what just happened in COVID um, with all the money that they, they, everyone was banking on making in touring in the last year and a half. And, you know, look, streams don't make you any money as we all know. Um, and that's where people are really, you know, getting their music from. Right. So I don't know. I, I think at the end of the day, you have the labels kind of driving what's popular to people because they're throwing money after stuff. That's really, that can be marketable. Right. And for us, like independent artists, you know, it's like, we're going to make the music we make and we're not just going to just, I, I mean, I've, I've written a lot of songs, um, most of them for left of the slash. And I just, I'm not going to just be told to just change the music for one way because it may sell better to a different demographic because I'm not really concerned about demographics when I make music. Does that make sense? No, that makes total sense. I, I remember, and it's beautiful that you bring up the Napster comment, right? So <laughs> I remember uh, going back to the Mighty Mighty Boston's. Mm -hmm. So I, every time they came into town, I would drag my then girlfriend, now wife, to every Mighty Mighty Boston show that ever came into town. And I remember sitting outside of a club in Dallas called Trees, and there was a band that was opening for the Mighty Mighty Boston's called Flogging Molly. And yeah. I said, I've never heard of these guys. You know, what's going on with this? And we watched Flogging Molly play and I fell in love with them. I'm like, right. what a great band. And so I immediately went on to Napster and I downloaded every Flogging Molly song I could find off of Napster. And I made a CD. Yeah that I would put in my car and I would listen to Flog and Molly. So I, I made my own record. So fast forward about five or six years, I actually met these guys and I hang out with them every now and then. In fact, they're coming to Dallas in October and I've told them this story. I said, look, I've got to admit to y'all, I stole your music years ago off Napster and I shared this with a bunch of my friends. And they told me, they said, that's the best thing you could have done for us because right. you, you get everything spread around that, that people will actually hear our music and want to come to the shows. Cause it's more about the shows than it is selling those copies or getting those streams because it's all about the live shows. It's not really about selling those physical copies because those physical copies or the streams or whatever, even if you're independent, you don't get that much money. But then if you're under a label, you get even less, but yeah. you can actually make a living having people show up to the shows. It's actually, you just brought me back in my head to um, my, my, my childhood because 
So at one point we were just downloading all music on Napster. And then we had, we would, we would burn it. And by we, my, my two, me, me and my two younger brothers, um, we would create like the discography of all these bands. So like I had every Smashing Pop Pumpkins album. And that's how I started like actually really understanding their music and how they developed and whatnot and really studying um, cause there was no way of like just going on Spotify now and just being like, oh, I'm going to listen to Gish and then I'm going to listen to Siamese dream. Like you had to like literally build that yourself and there was no way of doing it unless you just had unlimited fucking money and you could go to buy all these CDs, which nobody really did. Um, but yeah, no, I think like, I mean, Lars Ulrich really came down on Napster obviously. And he was the guy that, um, you know, <laughs> he just like went ballistic and, you know, I mean, a lot of people just didn't fucking know any better. And there was no real, like, what, it, what is the FBI really going to come to my house and like get me for getting fucking smashing pumpkin CD. Like they don't have anything better to do. So like, I never really thought about that, but I was also like, you know, a young fucking kid. I didn't know any better. Um, but it, yeah, you know what? Like if I was an artist then, and I would just say, hey, just fucking take it because you're not really making much more money on the streams anyway. You know, 0.0007%, uh, seven cents on every stream. It's like, it doesn't really matter anyway at the end of the day. You're not doing it to make money off streams unless you're like Ariana Grande and you're getting a billion streams, you know? And there's yeah. only so many people that have done that and you can count them on your hand, you know? Yeah, not only that, but a, a lot of people don't realize, yeah, it's like you say, 0. 0.00007 cents a stream. And yeah. so somebody like me, you know, I, I went ahead and bought Spotify Premium for the family because my wife kept buying these songs off iTunes for 99 cents and then listening to them for a month. And I'm like... I'm spending fifteen twenty dollars a month on you buying these crappy songs because she has horrible taste in music, and then she listens to them for a month. I'm like, I I would save money by actually going to Spotify, but then in the other side of my mind, I'm thinking, how are these artists making any money? And then I thought, well, okay, it's the live shows, it's the merch, and all that, and we'll it, get into that in a minute, but. One thing before I forget. So we have this digital wave of music, right? It, you know, everybody's listening on Spotify. They're listening on Apple Music. They're doing all that. But behind you, you've got a vinyl record sitting there. Analog vinyl versus digital music. I mean, isn't it so much better listening on the analog versus listening on digital? You're going to hate this answer. I got asked this question recently and I, so I've really bad ADD and ADHD. And what I love about digital music is I can listen to like Wu Tang and Rush and Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jeff Beck in the same five minutes, you know, cause I just was like, I want to do this, do that, do that. Now the process of doing that with analog, is like more methodical and you got to find the, you know, like by the time I've already put in and set it up on the queue and everything, I've already listened to a song. So um, does it sound better through? Yeah, for sure. But like, for the most part, I don't really care about that as much from like an every day, but from like, you know, there's two different sides of like my brain. I, I like to listen to music and I like to study music, right? When I'm studying music, um, I really like to do it on digital because I could really listen to it anywhere right over your headphones or the airpods or whatever or, or on my sonos or whatever um when you're listening to it it's kind of in the background and i can never play it as loud anyway because everyone always tells me to turn it down and i'm a psycho so the good thing about the headphones is at least i can control it and it's in ears digital music is is great for that as a fan because i always consider myself a fan first anyway um and but the problem i think when you take away the live shows the last year and a half for all of the artists, it, it, it was really tough for them to survive, you know? And a lot of people have moved out of LA to Austin, for example, you know? Um, and you're, and you're finding that a lot now, now, I'm sure even in Dallas, you're finding a lot of people coming in from all over the country um, for either political reasons or financial reasons. 
but a lot of musicians, it's, it's just hard to survive when you just take away playing gigs three, four times a week, you know? So um, I think eventually that there'll be some sort of class action lawsuit against Spotify because I just don't see how they can keep charging so much money to the users and giving so it's giving such few money to the actual artist. I mean, it eventually it's just going to be there. There has to be something, but the, the real way to look at Spotify, um, Pandora, all of the digital service providers, Apple music, it, they're just good marketing tools, right? You know, it, it's no different than being on, you know, a, a podcast like yourself that everyone's going to listen to and you're getting yourself out there. You're never, I'm not going to make money on this podcast, but maybe someone listens to it and they listen to it and then becomes there. It's just all marketing. You know what I mean? So I think that like, that's the way I look at it. And I think a lot of artists do, but a lot of artists are pretty pissed off about it too, because they're getting a hundred thousand streams and they're getting checks for peanuts. And it's just, you know, and all that money is just going to Spotify who, you know, their market cap and valuation is pretty, uh, I mean, it's pretty substantial. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of annoying, or at least it should be kind of annoying for bands that start today who, you know, were prepared to follow this well-worked roadmap of, you know, writing good music, performing good live shows, building up an organic audience, you know, hopefully playing that one show where, you know, an agent from a record company comes along, hears you, thinks you're fantastic, offers you to sign on the dotted line, and you go through that traditional route, but now you know it's possible to produce music and luckily go viral and suddenly be a big thing with next to no talent and you know not really having any type of game plan and do, do you find that kind of annoying that you come from the traditional kind of way of putting a band together and you know trying to make it and you know and you get some kids who are just put together sometimes just by a producer who just picks a few kids writes a song puts some production on it and all of a sudden it's like number one and you know these kids don't really have any interest in music it's just a stepping stone to get to something else and yet you know they're on every time you turn on the tv and the radio and you're sitting there like you know having played like 20 hours of live shows in this previous month and yet you know, can't get one hundredth of the airplay or attention these no talent TikTok generation people are throwing out. I mean, honestly, I, I'm 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 so old school the way I think about it. I, I don't really understand the world that we live in in a lot of ways right now with with social media and TikTok and how stuff and you know, um, like thankfully I have like we have a good team. Uh, that helps me with this stuff because I'm I'm like a fucking caveman out here, you know. I'm like rubbing you know sticks and stones together to make fire, and people are snapping their fingers, and you know, yeah. So I don't I don't look at it in in that regard that I get pissed off. I I, I mean, look, there's times where I'm walking in, I'll see a band live or at a festival or whatever, and I'm like, well, these guys just like I can just do better. But if anything, it, it kind of it it pushes me to just be like, okay you could do it better than fucking do it. You know, don't just like keep talking about it. And that's, uh, that went on for a while because basically um, left of the slash, like I, I stopped making music and, and playing in a band for over 10 years of my life in the middle of it. Um, and I was, and I, and I would see live music with my wife and friends all the time. And like, that's like how my wife and I met and, and everything. Um, but I, I mean, part of me was like, hey, like, you're going to fucking, you know, criticize these people. You got to do something, though. You, you can't be on the sidelines and criticize people um, unless you're just a, a critic, which I'm not. I mean, uh, so at the end of the day, it's like you got to look at it like in life, you have to like either do things or just accept that you can do them. Um, and I feel like a lot of people think they're critics and they think they know everything. And I feel like I know a little bit about a couple of things, um, but I always feel like that, hey, music is, is very subjective. And the demographic of people that are listening to music, as you said before, a lot of ways I, I don't relate to a lot of it and I'm not ever going to. And I feel like 
think it's only going to get worse as I get older and music is just going to go and you know and I feel like in five years I'm going to have like a Nirvana thing and have someone you know interviewing it and be like who's that and I'll be like I gotta go like I don't know how I'm going to fucking answer that question you know what I mean but like <gasps> it's coming. you know it's coming <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's definitely coming so let, let's go into the releases you've done and yeah. and it as much as we've kind of pooped on all this right uh we listen to your music through spotify so <laughs> you know it, it, yeah we kind of crapped on them a little bit but as a fan i just want to say i love spotify yeah yeah i mean spotify is great and and we listen to that but one thing that i've found kind of interesting with the way that bands now put out their music is the album is kind of dying it's all about releasing the singles. Yeah. You know, it, it's not about putting the record out. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't see anything wrong with that, right? It, you know, it's, hey, we wrote a song, we recorded the song, we released the song. You know, it, you're not running out and buying the physical copies or anything like that. And so most of the music that you have out there on Spotify, you kind of released as singles. So walk us through why you decided to go ahead and do it that way. It's a great question. The, so initially, um, when we signed with Symphonic Distribution um, and Jason Jordan's team, and I was talking to Jason, I'm like, hey man, like, let's, let's, drop, let's drop the album. He's like, no. He's like, <laughs> he's like you're gonna release 10 songs you're building a fan base and nobody's going to listen to it. You got to create buzz. You got to get your social media going. You got to do all these things. And the best thing you could do is release as many singles as possible. So I started thinking about it and I'm like, well, okay, you know what? I think all 10 songs on the album in some way, shape or form could be singles. So I'm like, why don't we just release a single every month this year and then drop the whole album. Um, at, at the end of the year is what we're doing. And it's been kind of well received so far and, and, and in that regard. But if you asked me like, you know, a year ago, I'd be, if I was, I'd be like, you're fucking crazy. Drop the album. Like all of the people you ever did, you know, listen to and, you know, idolize. Um, but again, it's a different world and you got to adapt. Right. You know, and now we promote each single every month um, on social media and wherever we are. Um, you know, and uh, it's it's fun because now like my my new goal and, you know, my, my new challenge myself is to try and release a single every month for the foreseeable future, including next year. So we're going to start recording the second album um, in the fall, which. I think we just froze. What happened? That'll be a fun edit. Uh, yeah, everything really froze. What's that guy? Because that's going to be pretty clean. Just kind yeah. of remember you it. You come back in. I can't hear you guys. I think you're on mute. So there, that fixed that. Okay. Yeah, every, every, everything just dropped, like all of a sudden. I don't know if it was us or you, it, you know, it doesn't matter. But it, I mean, it, it was just boom. It just yeah. stopped. That was weird. So it's probably those big record companies you know, saying, yeah, yeah don't, 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 to, yeah, yeah, don't, don't share our secrets or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it dropped just quick, fast and in a hurry. So, um, I don't even know where we were or where it dropped. So it's all right. We'll have a gap and we'll just continue right from here. I'll ask a question and we'll continue from there. Yeah. Guess give that. me, that's fine. Yeah. Give me uh five seconds of silence and then you, do your deal. Now, I think I'm a bit of a romantic when it comes to albums and I miss 
the whole concept of having an album waiting for its release and listening to each song on that album but even though i feel that way i've still fallen into that trap of really just buying the songs i hear and i like and now on the platforms like spotify or iheart radio or whatever you're given 10 or 15 seconds to decide whether you like a song or whether you think it's a piece of crap there's no real kind of growing time necessarily but you know Albums remind me of a time in my life. So if I take something like R.E.M.'s Out of Time, uh, take you know U2's The Unforgettable Fire, it was a period during my life, and different songs on that album bring up different emotions and different events, whereas I think maybe a single or a single song as such maybe just rev remind you of one night or one event or a very short period in your life because it has no continuity to anything else around it whereas you know you'd listen through an album and you might go through a range of different emotions through that album and yet there might be a message from that whole album but just buying just singles individually i think you know bands lose that kind of communication aspect you know you don't really get that chance to have maybe a theme album anymore where people are going to listen from start to finish and you know part of the you know the whole picture is more valuable than you know the sum of its parts yeah no that's that's really well said i think you just nailed it i mean because I, I was saying before that there's like two different like i'll put on xm radio on the background sometimes right and i'll just like listen to what's ever what's ever on and then i'll put on like bad motor finger sound garden and, and like study it and just listen to that um, and that's how music was really, you know, supposed to be listened to at the end of the day. Like if you're listening to, you know, Dogs by Pink Floyd, like you're not just putting on that song. You're going to listen to the whole album because it's it's something like you said, that there's a range of emotions that you go through throughout the album. Um, and for the most part, bands back then, I mean, I guess it, it, they, they weren't really releasing singles. You know, it was just we're putting out an album and then those singles would be played on the radio. And that was just the way it was. Right. Um, but now, I mean, it's like you could just record a single and like today, for example, I could go in the studio today. I could have it mastered in like a day and then I could schedule a release as soon as a couple of days from now. So, I mean, and if you're an established artist, and you have the budget behind you and the marketing and everything behind you, like, why wouldn't you do it that way? Yeah, I think one of the best things about technology is it has allowed bands to provide their music for free through YouTube and various other social media platforms. Whereas before, you know, even if you wanted to give away free music to get the music out there, it still costs you something in terms of the channels of distribution, in terms of duplicating cassettes or CDs. So, I mean, you do have the opportunity now to reach an audience where the, really the only thing you're spending is time as opposed to money to get it out there. So you do have that opportunity. I think MySpace was the first social media where yeah. bands really embraced and were able to put the music out there and you know people would send each other links and you could check out the videos and you know your computer after about four tabs would freeze because it's a piece of crap and myspace you know didn't put any restrictions right. on the quality <laughs> of the video and stuff no, that's but, true but i think it i think it has helped you know bands who may not have the funds to find a quicker route but you know again if you sound like crap and you just you know make crap then it doesn't matter how many people you put it in front of well, unless you have a really good producer, right? And well, let's, then then they turn yeah. around and make you sound. Well, fantastic. let's remember, Baby Shark is the most viewed yeah, video on YouTube yeah, ever. That's true. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I. I mean, look, it's 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 another good point. I mean, the, the good part about where we are now is that the cost to make music is a lot lower. I remember going back to the studio, fifteen. 20 years ago it was just it was so fucking expensive to do anything you know um not i mean stuff was becoming more digitalized and whatnot but uh the setups were not as like you know portable and you know everything was more just you have to be in a studio and now i mean look you could get some really great sounds out of you know a, a laptop these days and do stuff that you just couldn't do before so in, in in on the flip side of it all you know 
if you wanted to put out music these days and you didn't have a big budget or whatnot, um, it, there's a way of doing it and getting your idea out there and your your melody and your your thoughts out there, you know? Yeah, it's the same thing with podcasts, right? I mean, you used to, you had to have a FM radio station behind you. If you were going to put on a show like this, you didn't have the internet. You had to have a FM radio station that was going to broadcast you. Now all you need is the internet. Yeah, 100%. It's the same thing. Yeah, I think uh, also bands are a little freer to express themselves because I think record companies used to have a lot of control especially in england they would actually dictate which would be the first single released from an album which one was going to have the most impact even if the band disagreed with it and i'm sure over here it was the same i actually remember michael right. stipe saying the same thing on a few of the early albums that they weren't necessarily their choices to release but you know commercially it made the most sense from the record company's point of view but at least now you know as a band you have a little bit more control over you know, the creative direction where you want to lead somebody. It doesn't have to be what, you know, the money man says, all right, this is going to be the most commercially viable piece of music you can put out. You can put something out which you feel is perhaps going to build a deeper connection with your audience and really convey who you are as a band, even if it wouldn't be the one which might, the song which would get the most sure. And and replays. It, I also think about the movie, and I don't know, Stephen, if you've seen this movie, but I remember watching this movie years ago. I think it came out in 96 or whatever. It's called That Thing You Do, and it was a yep. Tom Hanks movie. And the whole premise behind this movie is there's this garage band that mm -hmm. they say, hey, we're going to play this talent show, and this drummer comes along and speeds the song up, and now all of a sudden it becomes a hit and then they turn around and they're touring around the country and everything and the lead singer he's like hey i want to do this and back in the day they're like no you can't do that we're in control of everything you do because we're selling you yeah we're you know paying for your hotel bills we're paying for all this but we're in control of this you really have no creative control and I remember my wife watching this movie with me. And she's like, oh, well, Jimmy, he, he's just such a terrible person in this movie. I'm like, actually, no, he's not. He's actually the hero of the movie because he's the creative part of this. And this record company is telling him what he's supposed to do. And he had the balls to walk away and say, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. But back then you had to be beholding to the record company. And of course, nowadays, you don't need a record company. And I think the record companies are afraid of that, that they're, they're dinosaurs. They really are. They're really dinosaurs. No, it's, it's, it's definitely an interesting um, thought. I mean, look, I mean, well, first off, I, I love that thing you do. A great movie. I was actually watching a show with Steve Zahn and yesterday he's, kind of peaked at that thing you do, but don't, you know, don't tell him I said that. But uh, a lot of people did that. That was a, that was a good one. I mean, look, the, the record companies, it's interesting because it's going to be interesting to see what happens when the dust settles for in the last year and a half or whatnot. And, you know, see what labels are, are really still out there signing new acts and putting more money in acts and, you know, uh, how much money did the record industry really lose in the last year or so? I mean, I heard a staggering number um, that in 2020, the record industry lost $9 billion. So, you know, versus making money. That, that, that sounds like a spot. Un, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, team. I, I think they yeah. are sending the dogs in yeah. to attack you right now. Oh, yeah. That's that's my uh, wolf dog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here. Well, Ryder, no. you quick. Now bring the dog up. Let let's take yeah. a look at the dog. I mean, he he it's only just fitting because the wolf and the shepherd that we bring a right. live wolf. Yeah, on yeah, the... yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. let's go ahead and take a look at this this guy right here. He's got to be better looking than the wolf. Come on, you know. We, oh no, we, it's got to be a bit. Oh, oh, here we go. Oh, oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. <Ryan. laughs> Now, yeah, def definitely better looking than you. Well, and like, less gray hair. He gets an extra two out of ten for being a dog, though. 
Well, we're that's probably true. on the same attractiveness level if it wasn't for that. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. We're, we're talking about point. me being the dog, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, now, what do you find to write about now in terms of, you know, lyrics for an alt rock band? I mean, they must have changed since when you first started. I mean, again, like I said, the map earlier going from punk and new wave was more about disaffected and disillusioned youth you know, not finding an identity or representation within the system. And then when, you know, the alt rock movement, which came about, you know, kind of the mid late nineties, that part of it, it was still a lot about relationships and seemed more aimed at, you know, high school and college kids. But now you're at an age obviously where you've got, you know, where you can have a family. So does it change the focus of your lyrics and what you sing about? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So when we were finishing the album, um, well, mostly the lyrics, the, the music from the album was all already done um, for, for years and years. It's, it's been in my head and written, but I realized that some of the songs either didn't have lyrics or they had, they had the verse and not the chorus and or, or, or vice versa. And I'm like, fuck, I got to go back to like 2005 in my head and, and, finished this song about a breakup that I had or whatever it was. And it was interesting because, um, you know, now like years later, what am I writing about? Um, really everything, you know, it's just like, I, I've, I've always looked at music as really an outlet for like expressing kind of what's going on in my life, in my head and not really try to make it about anything and just kind of like let whatever comes out, come out. And, um, you know, it's a good way of like, dealing with emotions and dealing with stuff that, um, you know, you, you can't quite put into words, but it's a way of doing it. And, and a lot of people now are like, well, what is this about? And I'm like, I don't really know. You know, it just, it is what it is. And it's, it's hard to kind of sometimes categorize songs and what is this really about? And, you know, now I'm being asked these questions and I still don't know sometimes. And, you know, some of the stuff I'm writing about is about, you know, happy things in my life, depressing things in my life, the pain, you know, it, so it, it all depends on what kind of mood I'm in, you know, I'm yeah. never it and being like, I'm going to write a song about this. It's never about that. Yeah. I find it interesting how, you know, it's very different the way women and men write songs towards certain situations. I mean, you take, I used to be a big fan of third eye blind, especially when the first album came out, the eponymous album, and you know how's it going to be i think was one of the best breakup songs ever you right. know i remember at various times in my life singing that you know kind of as an anthem now not saying for you shepherd because you were dating your wife when you were like in fourth grade or something so That's you probably true. didn't have that kind of angst of a broken relationship to sing about but you know when women sing about breakups it tends to be more kind of ballady you know you take adele or some but when men sing about breakups for the most part you know there's some anger which comes out of it because we're taught to you know reserve and restrict you know extreme feelings but there's no way to kind of let that out and music can be so therapeutic and that's why i really kind of got into that alt rock movement at sure. the time was a lot of that angst which was still a hangover from going back to early music like the smiths which i identified with because you know where did you find other people who sung about everyday things which you had something in common with you thought everybody lived like duran duran and spandau ballet you didn't realize there were people who felt you know lonely depressed you know no friends nobody sang about that stuff and then all of a sudden the smiths came along and some of the you know new wave kind of bands sang about you know that disassociative you know kind of uh, right. self in society but you, you know I, I think it takes a certain type of music to express a certain type of feelings and i think alt rock does have the ability to communicate in a certain way which resonates especially with males um certain feelings which a lot of styles of other music don't have yeah i think that was really well said honestly i mean um you know it's it's interesting because then it's like you know you could write something and then other people could start to relate about it and they're saying um well you actually feel like this also and i felt like this before and then it becomes something where you start, you know, sharing it. And then it becomes 
Uh, I, I can't think of a song off the top of my head, but you know, you know, some of these songs, it's just, it's about relating the people and relating to a feeling that you may have. Um, and I feel like that connects with people. And I agree that, um, you know, the male breakup songs, a lot of the feelings that you, you, that you go through there, you kind of have to bottle up a lot. And it's just the society we live in and, you know, where, you know, you could say the wrong thing now and now you're like a pariah. So I just don't fucking say anything and keep my mouth shut because I don't know who's going to take what out of context and like, you know, think I'm like, uh, you know, I, I don't know, but it's a, it's a, it's an interesting point. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you have to kind of like, you always have to put yourself out there and see how it's going to be well received because you're never going to write a song and preview it with someone and go through the, you know, the, the whole production phase and mastering phase and, and, and just be like, Oh, what do you think about it? Oh, you don't like it. Okay. Let's scrap it. You got to either do it or not. So the problem with doing it is that you actually have the balls to, to really actually go out there and say, well, this is what I'm going to say. And people are going to like either, buy into it or they're going to challenge it um and i think that goes into an interesting like point of you know a transition of the conversation if we live in a world where it's it's tough right now to say things that don't come across as controversial where where if you listen to some of the music or some of the shows you know 20 years ago like i was watching the Chappelle show for example recently if that show is on now I mean, how would, how would he have gotten away with what he did then? You know what I mean? Like, there's just no fucking way. Yeah, I know that makes sense. So what's next for Left of the Slash? Yeah, so um, we're about to start playing live shows in LA. We just did um, a live, um, they, there was a live show at the Troubadour that we got invited to play. And it was a, uh, it was, it was something called Global Green and it was a it was supposed to be all at the troubadour but then last minute because of covid they had to you know restrict how many people could go there but it was an interesting thing to be a part of because we you know we're on a bill with lisa loeb uh taylor dane um there was a, t a couple of different artists that i i just never personally thought that i would be on a bill with uh, lisa loeb um for for a lot of different reasons and thought that time was kind of over maybe in the 90s um so we did that that was fun um and now we're just uh we're playing um at the mint in la on september 15th which will be our first live show in left us last 2.0 and then we have some other cool stuff to announce in the upcoming months and uh we'll be playing south by southwest in in uh next year assuming that happens live um but yeah we're just and then we're going to start recording the second album uh in the next couple of months so that's that's really it it's live music recording and uh marketing the music that we have kind of simple in that regard Ah, oh, very cool so tell all our listeners and everybody watching on youtube how they can get a hold of y'all and how they can find your music all that good stuff yeah for sure so um I would say our, our most active social media is Instagram. It's just Instagram uh, at left of the slash. Um, we're also on Facebook and our music. Um, we have six songs that have been released on all major, major digital service providers, Spotify, iTunes, live by live title, all everything. It's, it's, it's up there. Um, SoundCloud as well. Um, if you don't subscribe to any of those and, uh, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. Very cool. Well, Hey, Steven, thank you for joining us today. And with all that said, thanks for tuning in to this episode of the wolf and the shepherd, and we will catch you on the next one. Thanks for listening to this episode of the wolf and the shepherd podcast. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, thewolfandtheshepherd.com, to your friends and colleagues. And please leave us a positive review on iTunes when you get a chance. Check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for additional content. Join us next time for another episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. Ooh.